Despite the book's disparate contents, there are narrative threads that weave throughout the book. Alexander Langmuir himself provides one such thread. The founder of the Epidemic Intelligence Service was a visionary leader who put his personal stamp on this institution. We'll get EIS officers on an epidemic as fast as we can, he said. Throw them overboard. See if they can swim. And if they can't, throw them a life ring, pull them out, and throw them in again. Although the lifelines and support systems for EIS officers are far more extensive and sophisticated, today than in Langmuir's time, that approach remains essentially the same. Without knowing it, Puneet Duwan, class of 2001, echoed Langmuir when he told me, the EIS is a unique experience that permits you to work on things you would never possibly be able to do otherwise, develop expertise rapidly, or fall on your face. Another theme that emerges throughout the book is that a disproportionate number of health problems afflict the underprivileged, the poor, the oppressed. The EIS is not a political organization, but it certainly attracts compassionate, idealistic individuals who look at the broader picture. EIS is the emergency room of public medicine, said EIS alum Jim Bueller. For many problems, the things you study with the tools of field epidemiology are the more superficial manifestations of things that go deeper. Racism poverty, underemployment, inadequate access to medical care. We come in to sort out what tipped the balance so that bad things happened, but we seldom deal with the underlying causes. Yet, epidemic intelligence service officers can shine a spotlight and suggest solutions. Yet another thread is that individuals with their own particular interests and personalities can make such a difference. What if D.A. Henderson had not suggested taking on smallpox as well as measles in Africa? And what if he had not had such a powerful personality in directing smallpox eradication at the World Health Organization? What if Bill Fagy had not run out of sufficient smallpox vaccine in Nigeria and so discovered the efficacy of surveillance containment? What if Karen Starko had not been interested in Rye syndrome or Godfrey Oakley in neural tube defects or Wally Schleck in listeriosis or Ann Shuckett in group B strep or Tom Frieden in multiple drug-resistant TB in New York City? The list could go on and on. In summary, I would like to quote from the book's epilogue, The EIS Legacy, about the nature and importance of the EIS. Many felt instantly at home in this CDC program. When I came to EIS, Sue Binder recalled, I found myself with people I would have chosen as friends. They were intelligent, active, had good politics, cared about people, wanted to make a difference. Similarly, Pia McDonald called her EIS colleagues the most interesting, neat people I ever met in my life. Patrick Moore added, most EIS recruits are not run-of-the-mill people. They aren't doing it to make a lot of money. We really felt we were putting ourselves at risk, selflessly facing down bad diseases to help other people. In the early years, most physicians joined the EIS to avoid the draft, but many remained in public health once they realized that they could have such a profound impact on thousands of lives. That same realization occurred to latter-day officers, such as Scott Harper, who observed working as an EIS officer in public health was exciting, important, and satisfying. Whether investigating an outbreak or writing policy for vaccines, I had the opportunity to affect many more people's lives than a clinician seeing 30 people a day. I'm blessed to be part of the EIS cycle, Amanda Sue Nisker said. For every outbreak the media hears about, there are so many that never happened because we did our job. Kay Kreiss recalled thinking, this is the best job I'm ever going to have, with infinite backup and no administrative responsibility. <laughs> Scott Holmberg agreed. Being dropped into an outbreak, given the authority to investigate it and to do the detective work, then apply that knowledge to curbing the current outbreak and preventing future ones, there's no better job in the world. Wherever you go, everybody wants the same two things, peace, and prosperity.
It doesn't matter whether their lips are stretched and they are dyed blue or whether they sit in front of a computer. They're worried about family, friends, tribe, nation. I then went on to provide a quick summary of illustrious EIS alums and how they have influenced public health. You can read that for yourselves, but it's a very incomplete list. I also wrote about EIS clones, the field, epidemio field epidemiology training programs around the world. And I concluded the book with these two paragraphs. In 1951, Alexander Langmuir seized a Cold War opportunity to fund a small training program for young epidemiologists who would keep an eye out for biological warfare while responding promptly to unintentional epidemics. Today, these EIS officers are the world's premier frontline disease detectives. For an obscure government program, the Epidemic Intelligence Service has produced remarkable results. Perhaps it has done so in part by remaining relatively small, nimble, and flexible. One of the lessons of the EIS history is the impact that one person can have. Put creative, intelligent, well-trained, motivated individuals into the right environment, and the outcome can save lives and lead to vital careers. EIS officers and alums have had an impact far beyond their original numbers. Today, with global public health bedeviled by substantial threats, the life-saving work performed around the world by these shoe leather epidemiologists is more essential than ever. The EIS program and its offspring have, in short, influenced and defined how field epidemiology and public health are practiced on our planet. Thank you for your attention. And I will now, with some trepidation, take your questions. Thank you.